I want to be sure and introduce to you Michelle Warren, who has joined us on our panel. Uh, Michelle is the president and CEO of Virago. Is that, did I say that correctly? Virago, yeah. Virago Strategies, a consulting group that provides strategic engagement, project management support for churches and nonprofits, stepping more deeply into the work of advocacy in general. And I'm assuming immigration is a part of that as well. Uh, you've been at this a good long while, haven't you, Michelle? It's been your life calling and passion in many ways. Indeed, for sure. Yeah, uh, she has worked uh, uh, across the aisle, of course. She's a senior fellow with the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Institute and an adjunct faculty member at Denver Seminary. Denver Seminary, yes, in our cultural engagement program. Uh, she's the author of uh, more than one book. The first is called The Power of Proximity, Moving Beyond Awareness to Action. And then Join the Resistance, Step into the Good Work of Kingdom Justice. Both of those books are available on the table outside. And being a person of the 2020s, you can pay by Venmo. I'll take cash too. <laughs> so there you go, Mark. <laughs> Actually, I have no idea how to use Venmo. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Tutoring sessions in Venmo will be at this table afterwards. Can we have a I Venmo have a seminar year next year? I can use it. <laughs> All I know is, never mind, I'm not going that direction. Michelle, I want to, if you would, uh, I'd love to just begin by asking you to give us uh, a, just a, a brief summary and update of both key local matters related to immigration and then those national issues and matters that you're most engaged with and work and think need to be addressed. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's really great to be with everybody. Colorado and specifically the Front Range pastors have been working to engage, not just ministering to immigrants, but becoming adept to understand the immigration system. And as I walked in this morning and I've gone from table to table, I keep saying, it's so good to see the choir. Yeah. It is good. It is good because even the choir can get discouraged when we know things, right, friends? Mm -hmm. And also, it can be very confusing. So I do want to at least share this. I'm not a reverend. I know I was introduced as that. Oh. I'm not. I am a pastor at times, but I decided not to go to seminary um, because of the work that I was doing. My husband and I almost... 27 years ago came to Denver and started Open Door Ministries. You may know it downtown. It is a little over 25 years ago. And in sort of the mad rush of forming an organization that would address social concerns, we began to realize that his THM from Dallas Seminary and my math degree from Cedarville University was not going to help us. And so, you know, started a couple nonprofits. It's only so fun to learn life through experience, but I actually made an intentional choice to go get my master's in public policy mm -hmm. and multi sector collaboration because I just felt like there's a lot of dealing with the output of broken and inhumane systems mm. and I don't even understand how that happened. Mm. And so I just wanted to kind of clarify that I am, well, I would say, I think Alexia has told me I'm an organic theologian. Um, I think about organic matter and I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not, but basically I for sure am a theologian on a journey. Mm. And a journey that continues to build and bridge relationships with people who don't look like me, who don't come from communities like I do. And it has made all the difference. Immigration is a passion and a call within a greater call, but I never anticipated being this person. It's just the circumstances demanded that I keep stepping into it. And so I, that's important because I just want to identify the choir and the brave steps we have taken as just the front range pastors, but also for those of you who might be new in the room, there is a good group of people who is aware and have moved in very intentional steps towards solidarity, beyond sympathy, but to solidarity to really enact change. So there's a couple things that I probably want to highlight, although we'll have a Q&A time and you're welcome to ask questions, you know, the forest and the trees and the moss below the trees. You know, I, I'm not sure exactly where we're going to go with it, but you should be able to ask good questions and have your questions answered. 
Right now, I'm going to just share a few things that are happening. There's, there's a few streams. I love how Alexia kind of put the blood, sweat, and tears, but there's three streams of the type of immigrants that are here in our country. There's the, the visa stream. People, there's a lot of different visas that are in the country that are, are, people are able to get. They're obscure, they're hard, we call them alphabet soup, but that's under congressional legislation. And so in order to be able to change or modify those streams, you need con congressional change. Alexia brought up you know, a couple bills, 2007, 2013. I felt like I was going through post-traumatic stress <laughs> and, and syndrome. That I'm like, oh, I don't want to go back there because it was a really big loss. And at this point, we don't see any willingness to work together even within the parties, to work with their own party, then to bridge across the aisle for any type of legislation. And it's really sad because we have a very outdated, broken system that is predominantly family-based. And so you have to know people. It's not that we don't have any work or economic visas, but the ability to get them and to get them year-round, especially for some of our greatest needs in our labor market, just aren't there. So I will say that's kind of the sadness, is we don't have very much will to bring any type of legislation through Congress. And that's going to impact the visa system, as well as provide stability in the second stream, which is what Alexia talked about with the tears. So asylum and refugees. So both of them require the same lift. And right now, that's where all the action is. Mm -hmm. The reason all the action is there is because it's by presidential determination that refugee numbers are set. It's by presidential executive orders that create opportunities for people to come under temporary status. And right now we've had quite a bit. We've had Afghans come through with a temporary status. It's not really refugee. We call that there, but legally it's not refugee. But it, but it still is this temporary status. They'll stay in that limbo until Congress creates what we call the Afghan Adjustment Act to give them a path. Right now we're waiting for that. So they were able to come. Same thing with Ukraine. Right now at our border, Title 42 came up during Alexia's presentation. And because it was, it's actually a very obscure piece of legislation from 1929 that kept boats with people who had meningitis out of our ports. And so it was resurrected um, during the COVID pandemic and applied. And even though there's some legislation, there's a lot of broad discretion with the president. The current president wants to get rid of it but there's a lot of litigation. So it's this on again, off again, every couple of days there's something new. So right now we're just sort of waiting to see, can the Biden administration remove it completely so that the borders can function the way they were intended to function? The reason Title 42 is a problem and a stress is because people have legitimate asylum claims. Alexia talked about that as well. This is a globally agreed on decision that kind of was birthed out of World War II that said anybody who is fleeing uh, their country because of nationality, prejudice, all of the different you know, qualifications, they should be able to request asylum. Well, when you have broad things that say Title 42, you can't even request asylum. And so getting rid of that would enable us to be able to have credible fear hearings. A lot of things are not happening right now that should but there are people that are crossing the border trying to get through and for the most part the u.s government has actually been pushing them back but mexico won't take venezuelans and so if you're reading the news at least they weren't for a while we have a lot of venezuelans that have come to denver over 4,000 have come to the bus on their own they organized themselves in denver back in december and that's because Mexico won't take them. Another thing is, is we as the United States government, we're not going to deport children. So if they come over, we're not just going to do a rocket deck and throw them back. There's exceptions, but for the most part. And so we have some protected people groups. There's some Cubans that we just don't do quick, you know, denial at our borders. So that's an ongoing dynamic thing. The other thing is DACA. DACA was done by presidential order, mentioned in 2012. It has been one litigation after another since 2017. And sometimes, you know, there'll be rulings and it'll get pushed down to lower courts. But right now it is back at the Supreme Court and we're anticipating a ruling at any time. 
The thing is, is that for people who are hopeful and really love DACA, we have read, we have read the fine lines and they have a very good case. We're nearly 100% sure that the Supreme Court will rule against DACA, which will leave 600,000 recipients of DACA without legal you know, permit, permission to be here, and that will require legislative change. So Title 42 is in the courts, DACA is in the courts, and those are some of the dynamics. Maybe through the panel I can tell you a little bit more about Denver, but I feel like I've taken enough time to give you where we're at. Wow. See, at policy theology, they both have the same <laughs> response. Thank you very much. It is super. Uh, I want us to, to think about the system as you've described it, broken and in some places cruel, uh, using the various, the various streams. If, if as the church we were to advocate for changes in the system, what would be the two or three major changes in the system that would be in line with what we value as people of compassion and people of hope? Is this for everybody? Or? Yeah. yeah. Oh. So I have a particular favorite that I'll just put out one, maybe just one yeah, to start please. with. And when I found out about how Canada um, used computers to determine their economic needs for migration, I just went, why can't we do that? Mm -hmm. Like this is sort of a no-brainer, mm -hmm. right? And it was in the, that was in the legislation that almost passed. That we would, instead of having these arbitrary economic quotas by occupation, that they would be responsive to data on our actual needs. And I just think it just aches my heart when there are employers that need immigrants and immigrants that need jobs and no legal visas are possible for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. To me, that's just a, a, a point. You were talking earlier, Danny, about how most immigrants are looking to work. <laughs> and then we have a real need for immigrant labor. Every country in the world has a need for immigrant labor, has jobs that citizens don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and, and costs that need to be kept down, it's like the cost of our food, right? So why, why we can't make this just natural agreement between jobs that need doing and people that need jobs just aches my heart. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge publicly Michelle, because when I got into this in 2007, how did we meet? I don't remember. But uh, it was through Michelle that, that I began to get involved with things. And so uh, I remember going to the detention center and all these things. Uh, I'm tall, um, <laughs> probably the tallest Guatemala in the history of the world. <laughs> but so we'd be, I remember being on, you know, that big avenue, which you can't remember, next to it. And we were standing there with signs. And it was like, eh, eh, and then it was me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. So uh, I owe a lot to Michelle. So I want to acknowledge her publicly and, and Alexia, because I, I respect her tremendously. Um, one thing Michelle said, and then I'll, I'll get to my point. Mm -hmm. um, this is how the Latins do it. We're going to talk. Um, but she said something, um, you know, in Spanish, she would say, haciendo teología en el camino, mm -hmm. uh, doing theology on the road, on the way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is what this process is, 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 is for many who are involved theologically and biblically, is hacer teología en el camino. And that would be pastorally as well as um, officially in books and things like that. And there are really two different levels uh, of academic discourse going on, and that can be another conversation. But something that came up at, at our table, and I think it's important, um, because even around our table, and, and talking with uh, Dr. Ramirez, um, 
And he said, he has no hope for the po politics. Each party is so invested. Um, I'll give you an example that I gave at the table. Um, a Democratic congressman on the border who's pro-life. Well, the National Democratic Party would not support him. Even though he's a Latino, yeah. and he's been in office for a, a while and done good work, he was pro-life, and they can't do that. So what you're seeing is, there's other power and political games, ideological games going on. Each party will just do it differently. Uh, and the pro-life thing would be very important to the Latino community. Mm -hmm. So all this stuff. But um, the thing that, that you, know, you were talking about earlier before lunch is how can we do this as churches? Because if, because if we think about the politics, which we need to get to, but if we don't start doing something as churches, you know, ayah chaos. I mean, we've got to do what we have to do, irrespective of what the government does. And if we can get the church, which we're not, I think you used the, mm -hmm. were you the one that was saying about um, on opioids, we're on opioids? You didn't use that word, but. Painkillers. Painkillers. Pain right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's what we're doing. I mean, instead of, we need to start doing things as churches. And this thing, even if, even if legislation were to move forward, it'll take who knows how long to implement and all the stuff that'll go. Um, but we need to get involved as, as churches. And that's, and this will be the last thing is if there's this whole social dimension to the gospel, which I'm really happy Denver Seminary actually embraces that because not all do, is that this is just a bigger component of compassion that, I mean, look in the, look in the Old Testament. It's talking about immigrants, but they're included with the widows and the orphans and the poor. I mean, it's part of a larger social compassion agenda. Mm -hmm. And... And we, you know, we won't politicize widows, and we won't politicize orphans, but we'll politicize immigration. But what you're seeing is, in, in the, biblically, you don't do that. It's all of a piece. Mm -hmm. And if we can get our people thinking as biblical Christians in the fullness of the gospel, mm -hmm. uh, we can have these political discussions, which we've been having for 15 years, and we're still in the same place. Right. So. That would be my two bits. So you're skeptical that the system can be fixed? Yeah, mm -hmm. perfectly frank. Yeah. I mean, it, it, even if it started happening tomorrow, it would take so long Generation. to roll it out. Yeah. 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 Michelle? Well, first of all, I feel like a little kid that the parent says, do you want ice cream, candy, or cookies? And they say yes. Right. Because I don't just have one. Like, this is a really hard question. Mm -hmm. And I will at least, I want to at least address a little bit what Danny said, is I also do not have hope in politics, but I do have hope in the people. That we are both a republic and a democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we were to have the passion and the hope ignited together, we have continued to see amazing change in the entire history of our country. And so I do have hope in the people and I do believe, the reason I said you have every right to ask any question and get good answers is because I know so many of the answers and it comes back, we have a very unfair, unjust, inhumane immigration system. And so I'm not trying to mask it in theology so that we separate our brain from our heart. Right. We can use both and realize that we can work together to get what we need to get done. But when I think about the one thing, in light of the conversation said Christian, yeah. because I, I have a lot of things I want to change. Yeah. Um, but the one thing with Christian, I just think of the redemption that we have in the gospel and in the work of Christ. Mm -hmm. And one of the injustices within our immigration system is the inability to be restored once you have... Right. come across and you are undocumented. Right. The adjustment of status towards something of safety does not exist. Mm -hmm. It does not exist. Right. And so I just have to ask ourselves, what Christian thinks people should be allowed to be stuck in a broken and unredemptive system? Mm 
-hmm. that we, I mean, there's, like I said, there's an awful lot we could talk about, but as Christians, we should say it is not okay to have a perpetual undocumented status, a perpetual TPS, be at the whims of some presidential determination, mm -hmm. but that people should be able to dig deep roots like Jeremiah 29, yeah. you know, and really get married and have sure. children and be able to flourish and not to be stuck in perpetuity. And the pushback on, for us as Christians, we need to, when we look at the history, we need to rise up and say, enough. We can no longer perpetuate a narrative and laws that say we want your work because we need to drive it with cheap labor, but we just don't want you. Yeah, that's where I would say my, the, I mean, the other area that I talked about earlier, or just underlying connected to that, is the cruel and unusual punishment. What is uh, TPS? Oh, I'm sorry. It's temporary protected status. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's basically done by the president, and they have, during times, like you'll see an earthquake or something big will happen, that they'll say, okay, this many people. Right now, we have something going on that the Biden administration has said is if you're from Venezuela, Nicaragua, Haiti, or Cuba, if there's 30,000 applications a month being taken right now for this temporary protected status. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, excuse me, please. Um, there's this, I think, underlying belief that Americans have that because it's U.S. law, it's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's just the assumption. And one of the nice things about this country is we actually can change laws. Mm -hmm. And so when I have this discussion with people about immigrant immigration law. Um, well, we have immigrant, but if I were to ask them, so, so what is it? Tell me. They don't, they don't know, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I, I think that's important. And what I do, and with all due respect to, to Brandon, let me give you an example. So I say, okay, I say, so Romans 13, yes. And so I said, okay, let's go to Birmingham, Alabama in 1950. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Let, let's talk about law in Birmingham, Alabama, mm -hmm. where it's actually legal to do segregation, it's uh, lynching is, we don't touch. Right. Okay, so do, do me Romans 13 in Birmingham in, 18, in 1950. And then I say, let's do Birmingham in 1850. Yeah. Let, let's do Romans 13 there, you see. And what you begin to see is you need to rewire this whole American mentality mm -hmm. um, that somehow whatever we do is right and just uh, on, on the particular ideological issues that we stand on. Mm -hmm. Because, like I said, we change laws all the time, but it just shows you how deeply compromised the church is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we see, you know, in... Um, we see Jesus have that nuanced view towards law also, right? Mm -hmm. Where he says that um, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. But he says, no jot or tittle of the law will be taken away. Like, Jesus respects the Sabbath. It's one of the Ten Commandments. He's not disrespecting the Sabbath. Right. He's just saying that there are moments mm -hmm. when, when love goes mm -hmm. beyond law. Mm -hmm. And so we hold that tension, right? Mm -hmm. Very yeah. good. I want us to, we're going to kind of go down three tracks here. Uh, I want us to make sure we have time to talk about very concrete actions that local congregations can uh, take in order to support immigrant communities. I want us to talk a little bit more about policy, but I, I also want us to step back a bit from policy and maybe try to address some of the, some of the uh, underlying fears, underlying um, attitudes and perspectives that uh, often frame conversations and cause us to interpret certain actions a uh, certain way. So let's talk about this idea about, of open borders. Should the church, should Christians advocate for open borders? Uh, if so, why? If not, why not? So I'll answer the Christian piece, but I will just say legislators aren't talking about open borders. There's sort of a fallacy. This isn't good policy. It's not good policy. Yep. The United States is a sovereign nation who has the right to defend its borders, and it needs to. Yes. So, you know, so I think that... That's just my personal opinion and 
and I just wanted to share that. But as far as Christians, we need to recognize that people move, yeah. and and has Danny shared so many of the stories of movements of people. This is not an American problem. This isn't a United States problem. This isn't a twenty first you know century problem. This is a global dynamic. It's always going to happen. And so we need to just recognize that we're not going to have a one fix all. So I actually don't think Christians should advocate for open borders. I think we are a people of the of the world. You know, we should have a global mindset and really care about both the push and the pull factors mm -hmm. that would cause people to want to move. What is happening in Venezuela is not okay. Back a few years ago, most of the people who were coming at our borders were from the Northern Triangle. Mm -hmm. You don't hear the same things, and some of it is because of such an investment in community development mm -hmm. in places like Honduras and, um, and El Salvador. And, I mean, there's just a lot of pouring out from the church as well as you know secular NGOs and governments mm -hmm. to try to stabilize mm -hmm. those governments. Mm -hmm. So I would just say that as Christians, we need to have a global and worldwide view of what we're supposed to be and maybe not get so much in the nitty gritty. I'm not saying that we shouldn't advocate for borders, but I think we need to have a hemisphere look yeah. as well as a global look and really try to invest in why people are coming, do they want to come, and what is keeping them? Because threats to their life, yes. you know, threats for their ability to get jobs and provide for their family should be a concern for us. Right. We should know where Venezuela is. We should know what's happening. We should care. No kidding. You know, um, just talking about, oh, you know, I worked in Guatemala for all those years, and I remember speaking at a church. Yeah. And she goes, oh, one woman goes, oh, so where do you work at Guatemala? She goes, I've been in Guam. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, okay, G U A. I, I get that. <laughs> but here's 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 the thing. Maybe uh, it was a hearing problem, <laughs> or pronunciation, or something. Right. But but here's the thing that I'd say two things. Um, that's the fallacy. No one is talking open borders now. If you go on YouTube, I'm sure you'll find somebody. That's right. That's right. And there are right. some academics that are pushing for open borders. But no one's listening to them, okay? I mean, so, but you can find them. And that's the fallacy. You see, if one talks about immigration reform, that's the label. That's right, that's and, right. And, and That's the code. That's the code. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no one is talking like this. And, yeah. and I think that's important. Thank I, you for bringing I that up. I think I wanna yeah. speak to the fear that's underneath that though. Yes. Yes. That's right. That people are frightened of being invaded and overwhelmed. I call it the impulse if you've ever had two dogs. If one dog is eating the food and the other dog approaches, what happens? That growl comes from deep within that dog's belly. Mm -hmm. This is biological. This is a natural. I'm scared of being invaded. I'm scared of being overwhelmed. I'm scared of not having enough for my family. Right. Um, and I think that there are are two aspects of that fear that we need to speak to. Um, one is that future flow is not automatic, right? It's not that people are constantly, there was an old Cheech and Chong, I'm gonna show my age. <laughs> there was an old routine about um, asking everybody at the border and they were saying, oh, and I'm here to go to Disneyland. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> right? That really, not everybody in the world wants to come to the US. Really not, you know, and it rises and falls with very measurable changes in foreign policy, in violence, in levels of poverty, that it rises, you know, that literally there was an investment at one point in El Salvador and, and the number of people coming the next year dropped in half. I mean, literally people mostly want to stay home. Most people want to stay home. Mm -hmm. It's very rare people that want to leave. Yeah. So, but managing future flow, I've always been personally upset that our foreign policy and our immigration policy are so separate yeah. because managing future flow has everything right. to do with foreign policy. Yeah. So I want to talk about that. The other thing though that I want to talk about is a little scripture that I didn't uh, end up getting to, but Hebrews 13.2 that says that don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers because you might entertain 
Angel. Angels. Angel means, it doesn't always mean celestial being with wings. Right. In Koine Greek, it means messenger. Mm -hmm. Messenger of God sent to bring a blessing. Mm -hmm. If you see the person coming, not as an invader, but as an angel, it changes everything. And there's just a lot of evidence that the vast majority of immigrants, undocumented or not, contribute more than they take. Mm -hmm. um, we also, there's a wonderful little book called The Borders of Baptism by Michael Bude that just says that from looking at this from a Christian perspective, that our primary allegiance is to the body of Christ mm -hmm. and our secondary allegiance is to our country. Yes. And so that really underlines that sense that if the person who's coming is a brother or sister, maybe God is sending them. Right. There's one thing I want to add as far as just numbers, just so that we get an idea of just what's going on around in the world. I think, I think the numbers are something around 281 million, million. people mm -hmm. are moving about the world today. And honestly, North America is number three as far as recipients. So Asia and Europe actually is taking mm -hmm. more people than the United States. Mm -hmm. And if you look at per population, Oceania mm -hmm. has the largest percentage of immigrants that they're receiving versus, you know, their, their native population. I think it's something like 3.6% of the world's population is living in a country that they were not born in. So it's a right. very small mm -hmm. amount of people. Mm -hmm. Oceania is Australia, New Zealand. Can I add some things? Mm -hmm. Just about Australia. When I was in Australia, uh, it's an island, right? And so people get there by boat. Mm -hmm. And so what the Australians were doing, okay, so you're seeing it's not only a U.S. problem. Right. They were diverting the boats. Yes. And they've actually uh, contracted with small island countries mm -hmm. to take these people. And they've built detention centers on these islands. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this isn't just the U.S. No. Okay. And, and I think that's important. Uh, and this is why I go to the Egypt example. What are they scared of? Mm -hmm. The numbers. Mm -hmm. And what's so odd is, you know, I'm doing Bible, so excuse me, but, uh, you know, they make it harder for them to build bricks. Well, the bricks are not for the Israelite buildings. Mm -hmm. The bricks are for the Egyptian buildings. You would think they'd want the best bricks possible. Mm -hmm. It makes no economic sense what they're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what happens in this country. Right? We need the labor, and we're going to make it as hard as we can for them to work. It's like, it's Egypt. Is what it is. Right. We sealed the border. We have a labor shortage. Can anybody do the math? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. I think that the uh, rhetoric generates the idea that there is that there um, that immigrants replace citizens mm -hmm. in the workforce, and perhaps that's true in certain arenas and certain places. Uh, on balance, however, I think what I'm hearing you say is that. There's a need for immigrants to fill the labor need, fill the labor, the, yeah, our needs. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that statistically yeah. confirmed? So, so yes. there's two different, yeah, there's two different um, phenomena. Mm -hmm. And one of them is replacement, and the other one is creating new jobs and right. pushing people up. Right. So both of those things happen. It depends on where you're looking at the economy. Mm -hmm. And you were going to throw in a statistic. Well, I was just going to say that a robust economy needs a very big workforce. And mm -hmm. if the numbers, it's not, it's not, it's statistically correct to say that we do not have enough workers in our country to be able to maintain or grow our economy. And it's actually not because of immigrants. They, when you look at the actual age of immigrants, including the undocumented population, most everybody who is here is between the ages of 18 and 40, which is a very productive time. When you look at the actual citizens of the United States, the biggest drain on our economy is our citizenry that's under 18 and that's over 65. Mm -hmm. So we don't, I mean, that is that's sort of mind-blowing, but yes, yeah, statistically, right. we just aren't producing enough people yes. to drive, and we never have. 
which is why we had Chinese, especially, and once the, you know, golden spike was put in and somebody decided to run for president on an anti-Chinese platform in 1881, came into office and Congress worked with him to get the first piece of federal legislation. And that continues to repeat time and time again that there are times in our history that, that there have been candidates that benefit sure. from dehumanizing mm -hmm. and basically not only dehumanizing, but not acknowledging and being thankful for their contribution to building the infrastructure of our country in an ongoing way. And the thing, if I can add on, um, and you would know this, Mark, as a president of an institution, just for the last few years, for the first time, what I understand, in American education, the number of white students is on the decline, mm -hmm. at least coming into college. That's true. And that we're looking at uh, 2025, they're calling it the cliff. We are. Okay. And so, and it's interesting because now all these colleges are scrambling to get minority students. That's right. Because the African-American population, the Latino population, and the Asian population are growing, mm -hmm. the white population is shrinking because we're not having children. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting, again, it's the Egyptian thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that's interesting, and, and uh, you know, I think Wilmer had to leave, but um, every, every major denomination in this country is either holding its numbers mm -hmm. or growing because of immigrant churches. Mm -hmm. And if you took away the hundreds of thousands of immigrant churches in this country, because millions of Christians have come. Yeah. This isn't Western Europe where they're worried about a flooding of of Muslims and oh okay yeah. no we're actually getting out of Latin America people from a Christian heritage yeah. or who are Christians themselves and God is actually bringing us millions of believers hmm. and we wish in some ways that God was bringing us more Muslims because it's hard to evangelize most Muslim countries <laughs> That's right. and if they come here then they're just opening themselves to the gospel <laughs> sure. let me ask a question about uh, in Latino that I'm going to make a generalization and ask you to think in general terms in Latino churches or Spanish speaking churches is there a unified perspective on immigration policy let's talk about that what what are some of the fears what are some of the what's some of the rhetoric what are some of the resistances to reforming the immigration system that you hear in Latino churches. You want us to wash our dirty linen in public? I was going to say. <laughs> we will. I mean, no, we're all, we're all. <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it that way. I, yeah. Um, because I think that's, that's an important thing for us to remember. And of course, there were surprising shifts in voting patterns among um, Spanish speaking uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. So let's, Let's kind of, let's think that through. I want to, I'm interested to hear what we're thinking or what you're hearing or how this affects what the church should be doing. So I want to speak as a Mexican American first, mm -hmm. just to say, um, which is in a, a lot of our churches, um, the vast majority of Mexican immigration is not recent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It happened back under NAFTA. Mm -hmm. But because people came into this broken system where their labor was needed, but they couldn't get legal, they just have lived here without papers for years yeah. in this endless, horrendous, painful process. Yeah. And then refugees come. Refugees mm -hmm. come from Central America. Mm -hmm. Refugees come from the Ukraine, from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And they seem to go on a fast track. Mm -hmm. And Mexicans are extremely resentful about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, on the other hand, there is a sense that we don't see people who are immigrants as the other in the same way. So, you know, I just want a little mini, mini story. Sure. I was in a, we were, went down to, to do some support for the people coming up from the caravanas, the caravans, right? And I was in a tax, taxi with a Mexican national and he was railing about the people on the caravans. He was like, you know, they're taking our jobs. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yep. and right. they, you know, they don't have the same moral values that we do. And, and he said, but, and, and then he said, and they don't even like our food. They want to eat pizza. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then he said, but I said, but what do you think about the Mara Salvatrucha and what they're doing, this organized crime? And he said, oh, it's terrible. He said, they're human beings, what can we do? We have to help them. 
<laughs> because for him, brown people were human beings. Yeah. So he was resentful, he was angry, he didn't want to share, you know, he had all these prejudices, but in the end, they're human beings. And I was really struck by the similarities and the differences. And the thing too is, my, my sister-in-law is Cuban. Mm -hmm. So her family left Cuba when Fidel took over. And so until Obama, Obama took this away. If a Cuban would just touch U.S. soil, yep. they were automatically legal. Right. Okay, it was a dispensation for Cubans yeah. until Obama took it away. And so the Cuban mindset is very different, or Puerto Ricans. You know, Puerto Ricans in immigration, you know, they're in this kind of liminal space where they're American citizens, but not fully, they don't. Right. And so a Puerto Rican will talk about this differently than a Cuban will talk about it. Yeah. Because Cubans were legal. Yeah. Until just you know, recently. And so they, they process it. Sure. Differently. And then on the voting patterns, um, like in the Valley in Texas. Yeah. Okay. This is what the Anglos don't get because they're so ideological, ideologically committed in their own sphere. Uh, so you, you find some Latino Republicans being elected. Mm -hmm. Well, the Republicans say, see, they're not going to make immigration that big a deal. But you see, they're going, we're pro-life. Right. And this Democratic Party has just gone way to the left. We're right. not going there. Right. Uh, we're pro-traditional family. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're not going there. Mm -hmm. So what you find is, it's not that immigration is not important, mm -hmm. but there's other issues, like for everybody, that are surfacing that they're scared of losing. Yeah. Like traditional family. Yeah. Okay? Things like this. Uh, the pro-life thing, where they won't even vote to support if you're born, you know, mm -hmm. uh, late term born. I mean, they're like, this is insane. Mm -hmm. And so what you find is the rise of a, of a, a Latino right, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that they're thinking like a white right, mm -hmm. but they're seeing other things that to them are sacred. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's been my conversations. Mm -hmm. And one last example, uh, I think sometimes, Alexia, with, with time, they forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to a, a pastor, a Latino pastor here, and um, he came years ago and he got uh, the Reagan amnesty. It was a Republican who gave amnesty in 1986. Mm -hmm. But no one talks about Reagan doing that, right? But it was Reagan. So he got the Reagan amnesty and he had come undocumented. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was anti-immigrant, you know, we did it the right way. And I'm like, no, you did nothing. Uh, but what he said was this. He said, but when I became a pastor, that's when I, yeah. I went back and I remembered. So it's, there's so many different, yes. right? And each party will tend to simplify the discussion because right. it behooves them. Yeah. But there's so many factors and countries you're from. All these things will come into play. Will come into play. You know, one thing I would like to add, one of my ongoing clients is, are Latino pastors in the state of Florida. And they've had a really hard year to a year and a half with what's been going down through governor's executive orders and some of their laws that have been put in place. And what I've noticed with, you know, these hundreds of pastors is they, they, are, they affiliate with a party and they've taken on some talking points and it wasn't until some of these executive orders that they, I all of a sudden began to realize that they kept voting and supporting leaders who were using their power to vote against them and their community's interests. So in addition, a lot of times people just don't know mm -hmm. and they have bought lines and just parrot them. And, and also I would say, and I, I don't know what Alexia and Danny, this is just in relationship, there's also a lot of shame. That's mm -hmm. why the other thing I There's a lot about. of shame. And so it's, it, I, I did an event within this last year at a church I helped plant. And it's, you know, the, there's a lot of immigrants in the church. There's a lot of immigrants in the church. But of the Spanish language immigrants, nobody except one person came. Like the place was packed. 
but but the immigrant community did not come. The Spanish speaking, because I think they were a little afraid. Two things I want to add to what Alexia said, because I think she was just so on point. But I'm going to I'm going to back up her research with some data numbers, which is of of the undocumented population that's here. Over 80% have been here since 2005. So it's just it's just not new. So we've got a lot of people. They've been here. And of course, even longer owned houses, businesses, US citizen yeah. kids. And the second statistic is that 85% of the undocumented population, so just a roughly that same number, has a relative, and mostly it's their children that are citizens. So US citizens are are their family members, but because it's an unredemptive, unable to adjust status, they can't help their undocumented family. So let me just say very quickly, under the pandemic, remember the, the help for small businesses? Well, there was a little clause that if there was anyone in your family who was undocumented, even if you were a citizen, you could not get any help. That's true. And so when you talk about shame, mm -hmm. people, I just found out, we have a doctor of ministry program in Spanish. And we were going to do our intensive next year in Houston. We have a Houston campus instead of Pasadena. We That's thought that right. would be fun. Two of our students, who I've known for, t what, 20 years? I had no idea they were undocumented. And they, we found out because they couldn't go to Texas. <laughs> they were like, oh, we're going to miss the intensive. I was like, um, and part of what shame makes you do is it makes you run really far away from whatever community you're ashamed to be part of, you know? So I remember um, my daughter, her first language was Spanish because my husband um, is Guatemalan, so her first language is Spanish. And we, when we sent her, she went, went to a preschool when she was four to help prepare her for kindergarten. And then she came home from the school saying, mommy, I don't want to speak Spanish anymore. She said, because you know, we're Latino people, we're not Espanol people. I said, what's that, Alina? And she said, and that's what they were teaching her at the preschool. She said, well, you know, Espanol people, they live in dirty houses and they don't have enough to eat and nobody likes them. Mm. And Latina people, you know, we just, we just speak two languages and, you know, I was like, no, Alina, we're all the same people. <laughs> but that little child, you know, is just saying mm. so directly. Mm. And so to, to not be, obviously pro-immigration reform is a way of distancing yourself from those Espanol people who nobody likes. I want to transition our conversation here to questions related to local communities of faith. How can ministries and in, even individuals, but ministries, local communities of faith make a difference? And I want to start with messaging. Uh, as a pastor, as someone who's teaching in a church, um, knowing that the, the language of murderers, rapists, and drug dealers, that they're taking our jobs, they're destroying our cultural uh, fabric, knowing that that rhetoric is out there and parishioners are hearing it. What are those powerful messages? I know you've given us some uh, in your presentations, but as a, as a teacher, preacher, what are those points that must be re-emphasized again and again and again in those congregations to help undermine this, um, this rhetoric and this language and these fears? You know, uh, Mark, this is why I commend you for this event, because it almost takes a team, right? I mean, if you, if you were to step back and, and look at this kind of uh, pedagogically. Mm -hmm. So um, you've had some Bible. Yep. You've had some history. You've had some data. You've had some policy. You've had some pastoral. Yep. And this is why it's so great to have the you know, three people. Yeah. Because each of us have different strengths, different experiences, different training, and things like that. But we have these core commitments. So I would say this is what's, what's helpful. And if I can speak as the Bible prof, um, you know, evangelicals say that they believe in the Bible, and so, we, you know, we need to make that part of the vision. Yep. And, and, uh, and Michelle would know more about this, and Alexia probably too. There was that Lifeway uh, thing. 
uh, poll where like 12% of, of evangelicals had even heard anything in their churches about immigration in the Bible. Well, how do you expect them to change their minds about anything mm -hmm. when we're not even giving them anything? The only thing they're hearing is certain TV shows right. uh, and news outlets. So, you know, I think a, a curse on our house. I mean, we were talking, uh, Reed, is that correct? Uh, you know, he said like half the people he grew up with in youth group have left the faith. Mm -hmm. Well, why is that? Well, you know, we were so used to giving people doctrine, we weren't talking about life mm -hmm. or the gospel in life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think especially this youngish generation is just, we're done. Yeah. And, and, and so we've brought this on ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and we've given such a bad testimony in so many areas of life, whether it's race, gender, Immigration. immigration, economics, the poor. I mean, uh, so I think it needs to be a coordinated effort. Mm -hmm. um, and it has to be one on one, groups. It's not just giving them a book. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Let me build on that a little bit. Sure, please. When I was talking earlier about the dogs, right? This is not rational. Mm -hmm. This is not something that you can address rationally and boom. These are very deep biological reactions. That's true. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I like social contact theory, right? Social contact theory basically says, it's very old in sociology, but it's been proven over and over again that people change through a relationship. Mm -hmm. But recent social contact theory over the last 10 years has begun to differentiate what kind of relationship changes people. Not all relationships change people to the same extent equal relationship changes people. Now, how do you form equal relationship in the church? By partnership and joint mission. Mm -hmm. We did a project that we called the Our Children Project many years ago, before the surge from Central America, where we engaged leaders from immigrant congregations and leaders from non-immigrant congregations in going together to a children's detention center to do prison ministry. Mm -hmm. So these were children who had been found alone in the desert uh, usually because their grandmother had gotten sick and they were coming to find their mother, right? That was a common story. And we would go and do vacation Bible school. We would go and do um, soccer. We would go and do baking with the kids at the detention center. And we would go in pairs, immigrant and non-immigrant, because we each brought some different gifts. Mm -hmm. um, what would happen in that context is there would be enough trust built between the volunteers that were going together mm -hmm. that people would begin telling each other's their stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when people changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't just hearing somebody you don't know tell a story. It was somebody you've been in joint ministry with in the name and spirit of Jesus tell the story. Mm -hmm. And then um, actually we had a huge Mariner's Church, 18,000, now 23,000 members. Um, the president of the board was one of the people who was in the program. And um, he ended up, we had this whole strategy that was going to be, you're going to do this, and then you're going to do this. He got so riled up when he got to know what was happening in the family life of the pastor that he was co-visiting with, hmm. that he just went to the board and he said, we have to study this. <laughs> we were like, no, we're not ready, we're not ready. But, um, but you know, it changes people to be in, in that kind of relationship. So I don't do message without relationship, because yeah. I just don't think it works. Yeah. Right. I was going to share that in addition to what Alexia said, we don't want to do message without relationship. We don't want to do any type of training without practice. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, if you're thinking about it, you can't just keep this in a theological, yeah. you know, ivory tower place. I mean, we have our theology and our praxis. Mm -hmm. And I, in the work that I've done over the last, you know, just in this last decade for sure, with the great mass exodus of the younger generation from the church, the number one complaint is that we're all proclamation and no demonstration. And so I think that's really something that should be on us because that same Lifeway research poll, they keep taking them and they don't change. That's the sad part. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that, that same poll basically said that around 80% of evangelicals, it might have even been a little bit higher, it's been a while since I've read it, but at least 80% said that they didn't even consider the Bible. Mm -hmm 
when they thought about the issue of immigration. Actually, I think it was 87%, because it was very connected, in my mind, to this next statistic, which is only 10% of the evangelical churches and individuals that were polled had any type of outreach or ministry to immigrants. Mm -hmm. There's a reason I wrote that book on, on proximity, because you, you can't just stay aware of something or even avoid the yes. conversation. Yeah. You need to move towards it, because that's what you're supposed to do with education. You're supposed to practice, and if you're not even open to allowing your church to have the vision or the dream or the idea that you would be in relationship, or that maybe MSNBC and Fox News is not going to teach you anything, mm -hmm. right. that maybe relationships, maybe being curious, saying, I don't know, mm -hmm. can you help me now, would be a really good starting point. Yeah. as far as bridge building in the body of Christ. I do want to say the Bible, go on. Yeah, that yeah, it's the Bible story along, it's not Bible or relationship, yeah. it's Bible and relationship. And the thing is, what I've seen in higher education yeah. is that you get like people, and Wilbur and I were talking about this, you get spokespersons for the Latino community that are Latino academics. Right. Disconnected from the Latino community. And the Anglo doesn't know. Mm -mm. And so you have all these people speaking about what's going on and, and you know, liberation theology and all this. Stuff. And I'm very sympathetic to many of much of that. But it's like, they don't speak Spanish. They don't go to Latino church. But now they're in this whole realm of Latino academia. And that is like a magnet. Mm. Because now they have status. Mm. Now they go to conferences. Mm -hmm. Now they publish books. Mm -hmm. But they're disconnected. And that's within us. That's the challenge. How do we raise up a generation? I'm just gone for 15 seconds. How do we raise up committed Latino and Latina evangelical scholars connected to the church? Because what happens, and I was telling women this on the way in. So, you know, I've had some come study with me, but I have this young Latina right now. Well, she's looking at some mainline schools. They'll offer her triple the money. Absolutely. And what is, what is it the Latino and Latinas don't have is money. Mm -hmm. And so they offer her triple the money, insurance, mm -hmm. and if she had children, childcare. There's no way evangelical schools could compete. No. And so what I've seen is young people wanting to move into academia as Latinos and Latinas, and they just come out. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is so big and so multifaceted yes. that, that, that one thing is the discussion from the outside, like you were asking us about the dirty little secrets. Another thing is the conversations that are going on inside. Right, right, right. And, and that's a different conversation. So let's, let's go back to, the, to this local congregation um, in, a, in a part of the city where they, there are refugees or there's a established... Um, immigrant community. What what are the particular um, what are the particular ways that let's talk about uh, Hispanic or Latino settings? What are the particular ways that churches make sense to that community? And what I mean by that is, what are the ac the activities? You talked about relationship. Well, how do you just kind of show up and build relationships, right? How do you incrementally begin to build trust and relationships with immigrant communities, many of whom perhaps are fearful of being in relationship with those who might expose them or whatever else? How, what, are, what, do, what have you seen be meaningful for primarily non-Hispanic churches being able to build relationships of trust and service with Hispanic immigrant communities. So I have strong feelings about this one. Huh. Um, there are, is almost no community in the United States right now that doesn't have not only Hispanic churches, yeah. but there are own networks. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That you know, and some of those are within denominations, right? So, you want to approach each other on as much of equal playing field as you can, mm -hmm. 
right? That's why it's approaching church to church and not just knocking on doors and getting to know Latinos in the neighborhood without ever talking to the church, yeah. which happens all the time. Some big white church starts a program for Latino youth and down the street, there's a little Latino church that's been doing programs for Latino youth and without the resources, right? I mean, this happens mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. So trying to build equal relationships and that sometimes takes some research. Sometimes it's slow, you know? But I think the, I think the important, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be politically correct. Mm -hmm. You just have to have a heart of humility and love because, you know, it's hard for us within the Latino community and I have a foot in and out, but I definitely, you know, have been, part of a Latino church for years. So, you know, you have a, a foot in. We, we don't trust at first when people come knocking. We don't know what you want. Mm -hmm. We feel ashamed, we feel confused. Mm -hmm. But if you keep hanging out in a humble way, you know, that's very touching. Mm -hmm. Like we begin to trust you over time mm -hmm. because then you prove that you're real. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's saying, it's being very real. It's saying I'm awkward. I know we need to come together in Christ. Not, I'm doing this for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm doing this because God is calling us to unity. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find my way to that. Mm -hmm. Can, do you want to find our way to that together? It's, it's equal. Yeah. It's from the beginning. I'm not, I'm not coming to take care of you. I'm coming to, to be in ministry together. To be One of the things that I found Latino pastors to be very moved by is when there's an overture from white church people is, you know, John 7, I want to live John 17, 21. God has been telling me I need to live John 17, 21. And we are not united. Can we work towards that together? It's very moving. Mm -hmm. It says, you know, you know that this is about your salvation, not just my salvation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is about our capacity to save the world mm -hmm. together. Um, and, then to, and then to know that it will be slow and not fast, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I'm very practical. I'm, I'm often very practical. Maybe the, the senior pastor is too suspicious, mm -hmm. but his son is really into this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? right? That's the person who's going to say, yeah, let's do something together. <laughs> you know, it's complicated. Uh, and it's almost case by case. I was telling you about this email from Ben right. Breed. Right. Here they have a Latino ministry going on inside the church. Right. Uh -huh. And they're going to ordain the Latino pastor. Yeah. But then the wife is not undocumented and torpedoes the whole thing. What, what if you just communicate it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's like, don't you see what you've just done? Mm -hmm. I go to an interesting church. Uh, I actually go to two churches uh, in, in Wheaton. I go to a, an Anglican church in the morning, uh, primarily Anglo, and then I go to a Latino church in the afternoon. A lot of Latino churches in the afternoon. And it's a large church, Wheaton Bible Church. And a um, huge church. But their head pastor is a Latino. Uh, he'd been on staff for a while with the Latino ministry, and now he's the head of everything. And he's from Venezuela. His wife is Guatemalan. Um, so that's an interesting dynamic. But yeah. they asked me to come to his ordination council. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in this ordination council. But listen, all the questions were, well, a, a good section of it was, what, what, did he, what was his eschatology? A view of the future. <laughs> and one particular elder who'd been there for decades had a particular brand. <laughs> but I, I, again, I'm just sitting there going, you're missing the whole point of having a Latino head pastor. Yeah. And you're asking him questions about his eschatology. You see, it's like, it's a total kind of... Right. And the other thing, this would be building off of what Alexia was just saying, you can't replace Latino community. Right? You just can't. Um, you know, the Latino you know, churches have this community. It becomes family. It becomes home away from home. 
and, and you're kind of an intruder to all this, and they don't know what to do with that, you don't know what to do with them. And, and so it's not like we're going to homogenize everything so we all can just get along, <laughs> which is how a lot of people think. Yeah. It'd be the same with African-American. Oh, get African-American churches working with Anglo churches. Well, you're actually asking the African-American church to give up stuff. Right, right. Right, and this is where you know, Brandon could wax eloquent on all of that, his experiences. But um, it's much more complicated. It's about money, mm -hmm. positions of power, yeah. uh, who makes the decisions. All these things come into play uh, once you get past the niceties of it all. And it's awkward. It is. Yeah, that's why you have to have a, a reason. That You have to have a spiritual reason for sure. it. That's going to hold you through the difficulties. Yeah. One thing, it's not a juxtapose, but it kind of brings us into at least present day here in Denver. So I'll start with several years ago, I was asked to do living room com conversations with law enforcement, business, and evangelical pastors in obscure places that this conversation wouldn't exist. So I decided to do it in the living room of a former law enforcement leader in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. If you put in anything with Coeur d'Alene, you'll find quickly that it is pretty much home to um, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, yeah, this is going to be fun. So I, I decided to do it. I mean, first of all, it was just really gutsy and that's what made it fun. But anyway, just to say I did it and I, I felt sad. I, I mean, they were wonderful people, but this was, this was actually most everyone's experience. I've never even seen an immigrant. That's not our story mm -hmm. here. I mean, we might need to pray that God actually helps us see, mm -hmm. because sometimes we look past. Mm -hmm. Can't remember if it was Danny or Alexia that talked about, I know their work, I just don't know their names. I mean, that's Danny. a way of showing dignity and respect, even if you can't you know, speak the language. But I think right now, you know, we had over 4,000 migrants just come on their own volition. This was not some border state governor's political move. People organized themselves and said, we're coming to Denver because it's hospitable and there's good opportunities there. That's become now our reputation. 2007, that was not our story, right, Danny? I mean, like, it is not the story that was in the past, but that's the story. And so, literally, I know so many friends, including myself, that you just drive along the street and you see migrants and you, people have picked them up and take them into their home. I've got friends who are trying to raise money to help with down payments for those who have found jobs. I mean, there's a lot of creativity. The fact that, I'm just saying, I brought up Coeur d'Alene, that's not your story, that's not our story. Right. And we need to ask ourselves, who are the people that are in our world and really challenge ourselves to make it a little bit bigger? Yeah. Not because we have everything and now we need to tokenize another trophy. Oh, I'm, and I'm speaking for white people as a white person, oh, well, I'm not like other white people. I have this immigrant friend. <laughs> that's pretty destructive too. Yeah. So the last thing I want to say about this is we, um, so for a long time I ran an organization called Mateo 25, Matthew 25, that was really about um, immigrant and non-immigrant churches working together to respond to people facing deportation. So um, five years we did this all the time. And um, that was part of why we created the Diplomado was for that work. but. We went through a period where the Hispanic churches are all backed out. And we started saying, what is going on here? What's going on here? And we realized that there was this thing that would go on where in our joint meetings that the white people would take over. Mm -hmm. And the Latin people would be like, what are we doing here? Yeah. And they, like, these people have money. These people, they can do it. They don't need us. And we don't have any time. We're working three jobs. <laughs> like, why am I here? Yeah. Right? So then what we real and the microaggressions, which is not a word anyone in the Latino community would use, but you know, the little things that people do that just really make you feel disrespected, right? Um, and so then what we did was we organized the next generation, the bilingual, bicultural mm -hmm. folks who are usually at the margins of the Hispanic churches and at the margins of the white churches. Mm -hmm. And so we said, we're calling you puentes because identity is vocation. Mm -hmm. You have a vocation 
to unite the church. And so we got them into the meetings and then they would speak up for the Latino churches. Mm -hmm. Like I just remember this very vivid moment where we were trying to help this one family and the husband of the family came from a rural area and he didn't read or write. Mm. And the nice, well-meaning white church people were like, we've got to get you into an ESL class. You've got to learn English. And he couldn't, he couldn't say, I, I'm terrified to get into a class. I don't read or write. Yeah. Yeah. And the Hispanic pastor says just sort of very gently, like, well, maybe it's not the best thing for him or maybe it's not the first thing. And the well-meaning white people just went right over him. Oh, no, no, it's really the best and the puente who was in the room, because that Hispanic pastor would not have come back to the next meeting, right? He just would not have come back. And so the puente spoke up and she said, no, wait a minute, you're not listening. Because <laughs> the puente could say that. She'd been speaking English all her life. She, she was like, no, I think there's something else going on here. If he doesn't want to do it, there's a reason why he doesn't want it. You know, it's not everyone wants to learn English. If he doesn't want to do it, there's a reason, right? And so that's when it started working better. Yeah. When we called the Puentes to be Puentes, to have this vocation. So I would just say that that's an important part of you making bet. this work, is you've got Puentes in your congregations. Yes. And they're on the edge. Yeah. And they're on the edge of the Hispanic congregations. And yeah, it's so funny, you go to two. <laughs> Most Puentes go to two. two, two I go to, you know. But, but how do you mobilize your Puentes? So that they can and honor them and respect them and support them. It's also very emotionally hard work to be a puente. Yeah. So you have to understand that, that you're asking them to make a sacrifice. But not for you, for Jesus. Yeah. You know, I was right? talking to Wilmer. Sorry. Is our time up? I don't know the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but intimidated I, I, about talking about time. But, but I was just talking to Wilmer on the way in. We were talking about this. Where the fascinating, he's just finished a study with the Lilly Foundation. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. That they're finding that second and third generation want to help the immigrants. Mm -hmm. They want to. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. though it may not be their experience, mm -hmm. it's their dad or it's their grandparents. Yes. I, see it, I see it at Wheaton College. Mm -hmm. They're starting to take Spanish classes, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And they want to help and they are uniquely positioned. Yeah. And that's what I am. I'm a Puente kid. Right. right? Third yeah. culture kid. Right. If we're, if we're coming towards the end of the time, I just wanted to at least let you know there's a lot of different ways to help um, immigrants, especially those who are new arrivals right now. And there is a great need. And so I'm going to do this, and you may think, oh, I can't believe she's going to do it. Well, I've been doing this a long time, and almost nobody takes me up on it. But I'm going to give you my cell phone. If you want to be connected to some of the things that are happening and how you and your congregation can get engaged, I don't have time to list them all. There's no QR created, but feel free to get my cell phone. It's 720-472-0871. And I'll say it again, 720 Four seven two zero eight seven one, and we can at least mobilize for what's happening right now. We are we're not at a crisis. We just are sure. in great need in Denver, mm -hmm. and you all have been listening. And let's get you practicing. Great yeah, one more time. Um, seven two zero four seven two zero eight seven one. It took them one time to decide they wanted it. And well, it's okay. It's gonna, I'm going to tell you. I, I'm going to tell Mark next week how many people actually reach out to me. And if you that call will make the it next double. 10 minutes, what's the bonus? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've had a wonderful day together. So let's thank those who joined us today. So. I'd like to pray for us as we finish. And so, Father, we thank you again for the way you've blessed us with these dear friends who have taught us and encouraged us, um, who have showed us ways forward where we perhaps didn't see any, who have uh, caused us to look at ourselves and our attitudes and thinking in ways that are truly helpful and transformative. And we thank you for the relationships and conversations that have happened around tables and over sandwiches and we pray that you would bring fruit from those for the sake of your name most of all we thank you for Jesus we thank you that we can confess that because of him we have life and life abundant and we pray that you would continue to encourage and strengthen give us wisdom 
to be the presence of that life in our communities. Uh, Give us favor in the eyes of those around us because of our compassion, because of our willingness to enter into the hard conversations in ways that are focused around your son. Thank you, Father. We love you dearly. We love your son. We depend upon your spirit. Amen. Amen.